Awesome. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everyone. I know some people are going to join us late. Um, my name is Matt Cahoon. I'm the Artistic Director of Theater Kapow. Many Theater Kapow company members are on this call, along with some board members. Um, and we thank you for coming this morning. Um, I've, I've known Leland now for a few years and brought um, his show, Rhapsody in Black, to the Stockbridge a couple times. Um, and last summer, um, he was back in the Granite State up at the Bank of New Hampshire stage doing a piece called um, Reentry Actors Playing Jazz. Yeah. Um, and, and we really, um, as, as I don't want to steal his line, but I, I will borrow his line temporarily. Um, as Leland often says, he, he wants to start a conversation. And we wanted to, um, we wanted to allow room for a conversation in our community about what's going on, about how an actor responds to what's going on at this point in time, uh, whether that be the pandemic or the Black Lives Matter movement. I think both are on their own tremendous um, opportunities for an artistic response. And certainly with them coming together at this point in time, I, I think a lot of us in the artistic community are kind of swimming uh, with a, almost a little bit overwhelmed with what is our role in this moment as artists and as people and where that interaction comes. Um, a couple of kind of uh, uh, logistical things. We are recording this morning's uh, conversation. If at any point there's something that you'd prefer not to have recorded, um, please shoot us an email after the fact and we'll make sure that um, that the space is allowed for you to be transparent and vulnerable without feeling like you're exposing yourself to some future recording that we don't want to hold, you know, hold against you. So um, please feel free to speak candidly. And, um, and if after the fact you want to have us make some edits to the video, we can certainly, we can certainly address that. Um, the, uh, otherwise, I think it's pretty much standard. We, we, uh, we're going to have a conversation this morning. And, and I, I don't want to speak for, for Leland, but I'll say it'll be a conversation. Um, there's not going to be a one-way uh, thing here. We, we do want to hear from the members of our community and, uh, and join us in this, in this conversation today. So without further ado, Leland, the floor is yours. Welcome, my friend, hey. to New Hampshire. Hey, it's good to be back, man. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity because uh, the moment is, um, is really kind of incredible. I got to say, I, but my preamble would be like this. Um, when I first saw the uh, George Floyd video, my immediate reaction was one of numbness. I mean, I didn't feel anything. I wasn't angry. I wasn't shocked. I mean, I really, my entire emotional complex just shut down. And I realized this went on for days. Days. I mean, watching the protests on television. The only thing that really got me, the thing that cracked my, my shell of, of, of protection, was when the 17-year-old uh, revealed her plight. The 17-year-old who recorded, who made that video. She went back to the site and she was saying, well, people keep asking me, how, what do I feel? How do I feel? She said, I'm devastated. I'm traumatized. I stood here and watched a man die. So when I look at that video and I see the impunity with which that police officer, the casual nature, the nonchalance with which he put his knee on that man's neck until he died, I began to understand the legacy of this bullshit. You know, the traumatization of that young 17-year-old, that her life is going to be forever changed, okay? What is she going to do now? Is she going to have nightmares for the rest of her life? Is her life going to be dedicated to some sort of activism? Or is she going to shut down and become another statistic? You know, so it's like, not only did that man, that police officer, take George Floyd's life, he took that... <sighs> he took that young woman's life. And the lives of everyone who saw that video. You know, so... Um, the importance of art and creativity in this moment. The only way I could get a handle on this, this emotion, this, 
the tsunami that was threatening to overwhelm me once, you know, once the dam cracked. I sat down and I, wrote, I started to write. And I put my anger in that writing. And my wife kept interrupting me so I couldn't finish it. But it was like letting steam off of a pressure cooker. I was able to get a handle on it. I was able to get my arms around it so I could put it on the pile and carry it around with the rest of the crap I have to carry around every day. So that's a statement for the importance, the necessity of creative energy and a channeling of these feelings in this time to a place where we don't descend into rioting and the destruction of our own property, which is what we like to do. This time, you know, although I can't condone it, at least this time they went to the places where it really made a difference. Instead of our own communities, we started, you know, destroying communities that people, all, the, the eyebrows went up now. Oh, we got to stop this. You know, instead of saying we're destroying our own, ah, they're just destroying their own, let them alone. That's the difference about this time. They went to Beverly Hills. They went to Soho. And they're disruptors, okay? They're not really people that I want to support as part of this movement. But one of the things that, that strikes me in this narrative is a young black man poked his head into a camera on CNN. He says, uh, do you guys hear us now? So, I mean, my wife and I have this conversation all the time. The pressure has to be applied inside and outside, like back in the 60s uh, with Malcolm <laughs> exerting extreme pressure from the outside from a militant stance and King moving and shaking things from the inside, working politics and all of those connections. And the both of them moving closer and closer to a political alliance that was really gonna change things, which is why they're both dead. So I'll end my rant there, because <laughs> obviously I could go on, but you know this is a conversation and not a tonic. So, so one of the one of the things you and I discussed via email was um, was this moment making you want to look back at Rhapsody in Black again. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that piece and where it where it started. Well, actually. Um, <laughs> Another thing about the universal thing, way of things, my wife and I were just having a conversation about what a magnificent time it was to put a push on Rhapsody, okay? And Matthew, I wanted to speak to something that you shared with me on your email, okay? My wife and I and a couple of friends of ours had gotten together with, uh, uh, in the park, in Prospect Park, which is where we live. We live in Park Slope, Brooklyn, you know, affluent part of Brooklyn, yeah, on the white side of the park. <laughs> okay, it's not the Flatbush Avenue side of the park, it's the Prospect Park, Prospect West side of the park. So we're sitting there, you know, having a lunch of sandwiches, and suddenly we hear this chanting coming. And we then witness a snake line, must have been hundreds of white folks, parading through the park chanting Black Lives Matter. I gotta tell you, it was a surreal moment for both of us, and I'm, I'm sitting there looking at it, then I look over to my wife, Michelle Ferrari, who's a white woman, and she's looking at me and her brow is knit. And we both say at the same time, say, I don't know. Because I didn't know how I felt about that, you know? Uh, you know, a crowd of white people marching through the park chanting to me that my life matters. It's kind of like, duh. But by the same token, I understand that they are trying to say something, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they are trying to, you know, push the needle forward, perhaps. But there was something that kept sticking with me that was kind of dissonant, you know? It was almost cognitive dissonance. It, was, it just wouldn't harmonize in my thoughts. And I got your email, Matt. And you said the concern is folk pushing us out of the way so they can make their own point, you know? So they could be seen as, yeah. you know, holding this flag up. And I'm saying, well, damn. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's the first time in all of this that I found any kind of harmony in my thought process. That rang true on my bell of truth. There are folk who are just piling on. My wife calls it the bandwagon syndrome. And was this parade that? Don't know. They ended down at the Barclays Center. And it was part of a huge demonstration. But I gotta say, it engendered these feelings and thought processes. 
you know? So <laughs> I think that a conversation is necessary in order to understand everybody. To know that, yeah, we need the support of uh, white folks as allies, but there is a concern that our voice not be preempted, <laughs> you know, not be misappropriated. So in order to do that, I think Rhapsody, with its themes of the other and conversations and, and you know, self-examination, could get people to, again, ruminate on what it is they think, really, uh, as opposed to what they're told to think of by the media or their family. You know, self-investigate, you know, and see where your humanity lies and proceed from there. Because too often in the past, fires have burned out. And the only thing we had left is the devastation of a rotten forest. And all the denizens of the forest are still suffering. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, Rhapsody was meant, engendered, to start a conversation and get people to see their own culpability in the systemic cancer that is racism in this country. You know, back in the 60s, they had a say, if you ain't part of the problem, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. You know, in a sense, if we're one of those three cops when George Floyd died, and didn't get up and pull Chauvin off his neck, we are definitely complicit in George Floyd's death. I had a saying here in New York, if you see something, say something. I use that theme in my show as well. You know, so without going farther down that line, lane, I mean, Rhapsody, the genesis of Rhapsody was to actually have people look in the mirror, right? by showing them the gold that can occur when one looks in the mirror by looking in the mirror myself and revealing what it is I find there about my own hypocrisy, my own bigotry in all the best meaning fashions, the, the most well-intentioned steps I took put me in a place of bigotry and it, it made me the monster I was attempting to defeat. That's gold. That's why I think Rhapsody is important right now. Yeah. One of the, one of the themes you, you touch upon um, in the piece, um, because it is so autobiographical, is about you know, you know, finding yourself in a room like this one, quite frankly, where you're working in a theater industry that is predominantly white and having to be the black voice in the room. Um, and I wonder if as you've, you know, Leland is a, is a member of the Actors Studio, um, and so I'm sure that you still probably find yourself in, in um, homogenous groups of people and, and having to negotiate that kind of um, space. And certainly here in New Hampshire, we're a 93% white community. Um, and then when you go into our theater community, I'm guessing that percentage probably goes up, right? To something like 97%. Um, so, so one of the challenges uh, I would say I've had as somebody who is kind of at the helm of a theater company is having these conversations in a in a transparent way and lifting the voices um, that we need to lift up when those voices just don't exist in our community. So, um, so hence today and hence and hence this conversation. And I don't know if you want to talk to the 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 industry or anything like that that comes out of your your exploration of Rhapsody in Black or. Well, you know. Uh... I, I, the industry. Uh, I can't really talk about the industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis Rhapsody in Black. It hasn't, uh, uh, if I understand you correctly, really gotten that kind of saturation point that it's 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 really a, a plank in the platform of the industry, right? I mean, it's not even sectioned by my union because most of the houses I play are not, you know, uh, equity houses. So it's. What I find is, uh, especially in the more homogenous communities that, go, that I go to, is that the turnout is low. You know, uh, I'm preaching to the choir. These folks that are, you know, who want to have these conversations. One of the first gigs I had was up in Winnipesaukee, you know. And uh, I think it was Winnipesaukee. I had audiences of 18 and 23. There were two, two yeah, because it was Winnipesaukee Playhouse right around there. 
Um, and in both of those audiences, I had a, a, a couple, a white couple who had adopted black children. And they were very interested in what I could do to, or what I could say to help them manage their anxiety about raising two black boys in this society. But you know, that was kind of stunning to me to find that kind of situation in New Hampshire. You know, uh, I call the syndrome of one white person, one black person in the midst of a large community of white people. I call it the raisin and the rice pudding syndrome. It has been, you know, most of the syndrome most of my adult life. And I think it's uh, the syndrome that is faced by a lot of folk of my ilk who come from a black community trying to get out into the world to find themselves in a world that is dominated predominantly and controlled predominantly by an other race, a white race. So in order to try to do anything in this world, even if you, uh, at one point in time, you're gonna come out of that black community where you're gonna have all the credit in the world in order to take that next step, you have to come out into a community in a world that is predominantly not you, does not look like you. <laughs> and so, um, hmm. I'm sorry, my emotions are like, so they come over me, I start to talk and I get, I get washed over. So if I lose my, my trend, please forgive me. Uh, I'll try to get it back. Um, but no, I can't say anything about how I'm affected in the industry vis-a-vis -vis Rhapsody. Um, I know now that there's a lot of folk in the industry that are protesting. I know that uh, uh, there's a lot more uh, content needed. So. Uh, there are a lot more shows that are producing black leads instead of black sidekicks. You know, uh, Tyler Perry has Atlanta, and you know he's got the uh, uh, establishment of the West Coast kind of scared because he doesn't need them so much anymore, which is something that gives them competition that they haven't really had very much. On. So a lot of the things are still extant. You know, we, I see that. Uh, in a lot of educational training programs for young actors, uh, they're not featuring artists like Wilson and uh, Maya and uh, Dominic Morceau. <laughs> you know, it, you know it, it, they're just not part of the dramatic curriculum. So, and that reflects on the industry going forward out into the world. Um, what I want for Rhapsody is to not so much preach to the choir, you know, and I, I've had an opportunity on a few occasions to, you know, really get out and, and for want of a better phrase, cause a stir, because uh, the greatest conversation happens when there's a little bit of friction, you know what I mean? Uh, so I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, no, no, I just wanted to, I, I was hoping you would speak to it. And I do see, um, Peter, it looks like you have your hand raised with a question or a comment, perhaps. Uh, yes, I do. It is a comment. Um, Leland, I'm so grateful to have you with us this morning. Um, I was in a Zoom session yesterday uh, with the Michael Chekhov Association about, um, well, really about and this is a very open and inviting association, but the, the topic was how to confront the systemic racism in that association. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it was a very um, emotional two hours. Um, so I, I would, I just wanna, um, I suppose just for my own need, if I can assert my own need, um, it's important to me that we not only talk about the institution of American theater or, uh, or systems of racism, although I don't want to leave those, I mean, obviously we need to confront those things, but I think it's important also that we talk about our own racism, even if it is subliminal, even if, uh, I mean, we all have the need to think of ourselves as good people. Um, let me put it this way. I need to confront, I need to confront systemic racism and my own and to learn the connection between those things. You know, um, I'm a positive person. 
you know, since I came up out from my mother's house, that one of the first assessments that the public gave me, public being my peer group, was I was a happily idealistic fool, you know. And, and I guess I am, because even in the face of the most dire consequences, I tend to ferret out the positive. And, and I guess that's, that's the syndrome that a lot of black people have been doing forever, you know. But what has really fed and fueled that for me is the present day, uh, I, I want to say phenomenon, that's the word that comes to mind, of speaking to people who, and I hate to use this word, but it, it, it really works, are uh, woke, who are uh, aware of their own culpability, because aware that there's an unconscious bias that needs to be ferreted out and addressed. You know, and the first thing that, that, that makes me really happy is when people, when people say, I know that I'm, I'm part of this and I want to know uh, how, I want to know uh, how I can do something to address it. You know, who sincerely look me in the face and they're not, you know, bringing out their symbols and joining my bandwagon. And they want to really know what to do. There's a large percentage of people that I am encountering in my life right now that are of that ilk. That gives me hope because again, the point of my show is self-excavation because when, all, when it's all said and done, as human beings, we got to be able to look that human being in the eye in the mirror and be happy and say, yeah, I'm a human being because I respect human beings. And no human being is less than me. And the, damn it, no human being is more than me either. So I mean, look, man. The hardest thing to do for a human, I think, is to look in the deepest, darkest corners of their psyche and ferret out the dark shit. The places that, the stuff that doesn't look good that we're ashamed of. But if you don't take out the garbage, your house is gonna forever stink, <laughs> you know? So what you gonna do? So yeah, Peter, you're right. It starts with you. It starts inside because that radiation, that bell of truth, you know, it'll act like a tuning fork, man, and you'll find harmony with like-minded folk joining you. And really, that's what's happening to the greater extent, bandwagon syndrome and all, right now in society. And that's what's exciting to me. I say, stay in your lane. Make the changes you can make from your wheelhouse. Because that's where you are going to be the most effective in whatever you do. If you're heading a theater, if you have an organization, how many people of color are represented in the hierarchy of your theater or your organization? that help make the decisions, that bring in the work, that hire the people, that disseminate the ideas, so that you're not having one point of view from <laughs> an, an a, a kind of 30,000 feet without any information from the ground level. You know, if you're a supermarket checker, <laughs> and you know, you're next to a guy who just checked out his white woman and did not ask her for any identification to cash a check, but asked the next blood, black woman in line for identification to check, cash the check. Why did you do that? Why did you stay in your lane? Effect change from your level because you're going to be the most effective from that point of view. So as you get out of your lane and try to do something else, you're not only going to be less effective, you might get in somebody else's way. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's, yeah. that's all I can say to you, dude. That's, that's really, I mean, I, there's something about little wins. You know, we so often want to go after the big wins, but maybe what you're speaking to is win the little fights that you can fight on your own space before worrying about those big, big wins. Any other uh, thoughts, comments, questions? Katie has a hand up. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, Leland. I work for the Capital Center for the Arts, where we hosted Rhapsody in Black in our Spotlight Cafe. 
some right. years ago and I, and the bank of New Hampshire stage where we saw you this summer. Um, so wonderfully in, in actors playing jazz. Um, and Matt, I think you might be able to chime in on this too, but one of the battles I f seem to be fighting a lot is to convince my leadership peers in other sectors, in education, in policymaking, in healthcare, to use works of theater as ways of opening up a discussion. And I went through a pretty intensive program in 2017 called the Leadership Learning Exchange for Equity, where we really look at issues of racism and equity in the state. And this was born out of a program from the New Hampshire Endowment for Health, whose CEO is an African-American woman and said, stop coming to the African-American leaders in the state and asking, what should we do? Like, get your white people in a room and, and just look at the ugly stuff. And they did. And it was with an a organization called New Hampshire Listens. And, um, but I was the only person from the arts community in that group. It was really intensive. Um, a lot of really, you know, like Peter says, owning your own stuff and really looking at your own unexamined biases and unpacking those. And it was ugly and embarrassing and really worth it. But one of the things I kept saying is, you know, you, there are these wonderful tools. And I used Rhapsody in Black as an example of these pieces that you can bring your leadership to, that you can bring your constituents to, that you can use to start these conversations. And the New Hampshire conference on race and equity was actually held at our theater they used our theater but they didn't include any theater like this is just sort of a constant battle <laughs> that i feel like you know and i i think i see matt nodding so i think matt you know maybe this is a challenge to us to the conversation has shifted enough now i think at a statewide level that maybe people will sit up and pay attention because i couldn't get those members of the Board of Leadership New Hampshire to come to Rhapsody in Black while we were sitting around a board table talking about not having enough representation in our Leadership New Hampshire classes. You know, I couldn't get them to sort of start to open things up in a different way. Um, I know that the uh, UNH uh, Institute, uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion has recently partnered with New Hampshire Theater Project on some work. So there's some change starting to happen, but um, I, I just sort of throw that out as maybe it's something that those of us in decision-making powers in, in theaters can can try to you know do more of. It's fascinating, and I'll, I'll obviously let Leland speak to this. But you know, I, as an arts presenter, um, we are often hit with, "Hey, it's February. Do something with a black person in the cast." Um, and it's uh, it seems to me so offensive every time that conversation. And it it's often <laughs> some of my friends, but it's often agents who will push that angle, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, an artist agent will say like, hey, I've got this great show for Black History Month. And you're like, okay, but can we talk about Black history without it being February? Um, and so uh, I would say I'm in a little bit of a, a, a good position because we did two shows of Rhapsody in Black, and we did one where we had the entirety of our, I think it was our sophomore class. And then mm -hmm. we did one where it was the public performance and I think 18 people came, right? So in my position, I was able to put Leland in front of 800 or so sophomores and that, um, who didn't pay a dime to see it, but that uh, moment was so much more instructive and important to me as a programmer than were the 18 people, the 18 woke people who came, you know, at seven o'clock at night to see the show. Um, because I guarantee you, as sad as it is to say, that some of those sophomores in high school had extraordinarily closed minds, mm -hmm. right? And so they were the people that Leland is talking about who really need to be a part of that conversation. So I think, yeah, as arts leaders in this state and anywhere, honestly, um, getting programming, uh, I, I mean, you know, Katie, you're just, you're speaking my language. <laughs> I, you know, my, my, my title at Pinkerton is Director of Cultural Programming. I feel a, a responsibility to expose the students at Pinkerton to other cultures. And, um, and that's what I do every day, but it's, it's hard. It costs money and you're right. There isn't that connection between decision makers and artists that, they don't understand how the arts can be used in that way to start conversations. So I don't know, Leland, do you want to speak to that at all? 
Uh, yeah, man. I mean, I've done a lot of shows in recurring places and saying, well, can I come and do a show in a month that doesn't end in Aerie, you know? <laughs> How about a month that ends in Oon, <laughs> you know? <laughs> or lie, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Gust would be great, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, but uh, again, um, these knives have two edges oftentimes. Uh, the one cut is, yeah, you're providing work for people of color in places that don't normally take work for people of color. So an agent is going to sell a place that doesn't have a black uh, audience or subscription base or uh, that has the ability to do one show without losing their subscription base. They're going to try to sell them a black show during Black History Month. And of course, that's yeah, that's cool. That's what's supposed to happen. It's Black History Month. So uh, I can't fault the agent for that. But then by the same token, it kind of perpetuates a kind of positive feedback loop for that same kind of thing. So, well, we did our show in February, you know. <laughs> Why do we need to do another one, you know? But, you know, um, see, it gets back down, and I think we're talking about leadership here because it's all about the people who pull, pull the strings, who make the decisions. That's why the push is to get people of color in those positions so you have other perspectives in order to get the needle pushed in that direction. In the meantime, until that happens, you have to have some sort of, I think, have to, it would be helpful, and, and I've seen this happen in these terms. I did a workshop for teachers in the Wappingers Falls school system because they were concerned about how to start a conversation about my show with their students, because it's kind of like they have multicultural students there, you know, and it's like, uh, I, one story was I talked to this young black woman who was, you know, biracial, and she told me, uh, this is the teacher telling me, I, I, don't, I don't know what the, all this racism business is about, it doesn't, I don't see it. And it's like, how do, you, how do you talk to somebody who's obviously perceived by society as a black person, but does not see themselves in society as a black person? I mean, how do you start the conversation with somebody like that? So, I mean, these teachers were concerned about that. So I put together a workshop and went up there and we talked about the origins of racism in this country, where are the uh, uh, monikers, the appellations and uh, uh, disparaging uh, uh, nicknames come from, you know, so from the N-word on down and why they happened and why they were formulated. We, we find a way to say, look, man, this is just a construct. So it kind of takes some of the emotional sting out of it. We understand that it is uh, a, a construct that has planks and, and screws and, and nuts and bolts that can be dismantled. And when you put them in that kind of thought process, it Oddly enough, uh, this information wakes up not only the fact that this stuff is real and exists and, and it gets them to look at it in a way that they hadn't before, because then they can understand it a little better. And that is the doorway and an avenue to have some information come in whereby it can be filtered and maybe they'll make a different decision. So they need to be educated. And the best way to do so, I think, is to let them know, hey, look, this is what you're dealing. You don't see it. But this is what you're dealing with, and this is why. And it is, it is so logical. <laughs> it is just so mathematical in its genesis and to where we are right now. So if those kinds of things can be put into place where you can drag them kicking and screaming to some place where they can expand their knowledge of the zeitgeist, what it is that we're actually talking about, to you know, bring it into some sort of handleable context, shape, that's more easily ingested, you know? Um, I found that to be helpful with those teachers. And those teachers, again, part the choir, those teachers really appreciated that. So if we're gonna have leaders making these decisions, we need to either educate the leaders or switch them out, <laughs> you know, so that this is what we're after. This is the kind of thing, the kind of push that this moment 
should net, I mean, as, uh, at least the result of slowing this monster down, putting people in position that will make the decisions to elevate what's really real and, you know, move that forward. I think that's what's necessary. So a way to do that, a thought, press, a thought process by which we can do that. You know, because um, if, if they see that, then they'll see the value of what Rhapsody is trying to do. You know, forever hopeful. Yeah. Any other thoughts or observations from our, our collected few here? Uh, I, I wanted to touch upon one, something you just said, because um, we all know we live in a world where what's, what's real is constantly in question. What's true is constantly being questioned by leadership. Um, you know, it's become a cliche to make fun of the president by saying fake news, but there's something really insidious under that that is making people question reality that I think is really, really dangerous. A few of us on this call live in the city of Manchester where one of our aldermen used a racial slur on social media yesterday and is now claiming he didn't realize it was a racial epithet, that he didn't know and nobody ever really thought of it as a racial word. And, and already the, the narrative is becoming, it's just not true. You know, what's true and what's not true has become such a, uh, I, I never thought that black and white, for pardon the pun, would be so in question, right? Like the sky is blue, and then somebody could say, "Oh no, the sky's not blue." And I and I and it, we seem to be living in this really scary time where um, that is being undermined on a daily basis at every level of uh, of our country's leadership, whether that be federal, state, or even the very local, like here with our alderman yesterday. So just a comment, but. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's a comment that, uh, it's a point that I, I address in, in, in at least the talk backs of my show. You know, again, um, it is difficult in any time to discern what is true and what is false, because people smile on your face all the time, stab you in the back. I mean, in certain times like these, uh, in recent past, uh, since, well, three plus years now, uh, a fact has morphed into alternative facts. And I really appreciated the CNN uh, 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 thrust that said, this is an apple, <laughs> not a banana. So, you know, trying to preserve uh, the truth of what a fact is. But, you know, again, um, we are human beings uniquely equipped with viscera that if we listen to, will never lead us wrong. People ask me what I should do. And I said something to Peter about what can be done. But guess what? We know what to do. We know what to do. We know when we hear bullshit. Like Bono and Francis says, separate the shit from the alfalfa. We know that. We can do that as human beings. We do it every day. So we are going to ascribe a certain more true to Obama than Trump without doing any work about what that really says to me, right? What is true to me, you know? We know what to do. We know what truth is. We allow ourselves to be taken to the various and sundry places, but we know what it is, you know? So yeah, that's why, that's why Agent Orange and his minions try so hard to flood us with this disinformation and this obfuscation because they know the truth of truth. They know the truth and the power of facts. So they're just throwing a whole bunch of chum in the water. And you know, we know that. So are we going to use all of our energy decrying the fact that he's throwing chum in the water? Or are we going to use our energy to promulgate the truth that we know exists? What wolf are you going to feed? I mean, you know, again, this is an idealistic point of view because who's actually going to do that? More people than you think. Give them a chance. So yeah, 
soldier on. Matt, you know your truth. Peter, you know what truth is. You know, we know what truth is. We know what it is. Viscerally, we feel it. We wake up in the morning and know it. We go to bed at night and know it and dream about it when we're sleeping. We know what it is. Act on that. And if the information you're getting from the airwaves in this time that we know is politically divided, that everybody's coming at you with their point of view, it's even more important to come up with your own, <laughs> you know? Let's take a flag in that. Sure. Justin, you wanted to say something? You're muted, friend. There you go. Um, it was remarkable to me over maybe the last 20 years at the speed that progress was made with the sort of gay rights movement in America. Um, from, you know, I remember the first time Obama ran, he didn't feel comfortable speaking out in favor of gay marriage. But then by the end, you know, the, lighthouse, the White House was lit up in, in rainbow lights, right? And I, I really felt like what happened was that people had relatives and friends and people in their own families that they loved, that they understood as not other, that could say to them, I'm this way, you know, this othering you're doing, it doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? I'm a human and you know me, so think about your position on this. And I think it's, it's harder in a situation like this because we, you know, in a community like New Hampshire or New England where there, there are pockets of just no diversity, uh, anybody telling a story is sort of an outsider or another in a way. And I wonder if, if you find that your biographical based work connects better when you talk to audiences afterwards, because it's not, a, you know, a, a story being foisted on them. It's your story and you're standing there to, to, to talk. Do you find that that kind of work has more power with, with audiences in places that maybe aren't, where you're, where you're the other, basically? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, my show, what, I found that when I do my show and I tell my story, when you get to know this little black kid in the ghetto, who, you know, one of the first things his consciousness gives you is the fact that uh, you see his consciousness revealed to him is how little his life is worth. Well, no, how poor he is. You know, he, he, he realizes he's poor. You don't know you're poor until you see somebody else who has. Then he sees somebody who has realized he doesn't have it, so now he's poor. So that's like a worm inveigling into your psyche, right? Suddenly, next thing you know is somebody in his neighborhood gets killed. And people on the street, seeing the guy die hanging out the window, laugh. Damn, it took him a long time to die laugh and walk along. So here's this poor kid who has no self-worth, you know, knows his life is worth crap, you know, turns to drugs, alcohol. You see this happen. So you see, without dealing with racism, you see where he is in his own little community as a human being, what he's being faced with in his choice pool. So all of a sudden, you're not into a racial story, even though I set it up at the top. You're looking at this kid who's kind of charming, you know, sets his hat to the side, he's a little bit of a thuggish, but he's a kid like any other kid trying to find his own way and his own identity. If I'm successful, by the time you get to the scene of instruction where this 17 year old who's tried to turn his life around from a life of crime and drugs and alcoholism, well, life of crime at this point, when he is hit in the head with being called the N word in front of a bunch of white folks at a, <laughs> at a consortium that's supposed to be talking about how we can deal with racism. <laughs> you know, the scene of instruction, which I set up at the beginning of the show, by the time you get to there with him, if that doesn't hit you at least as hard as it hits him, there's no humanity in you. So now I got you. So now you're looking at a human being who now goes through his life being buffeted about like a wind, a leaf in the wind by racism. And all of the things this man tries to do, this kid tries to do, growing into manhood to fight this demon in himself, the destructive power of this demon on him, to where you see he goes through a place where he discovers that not all white people are racist. That even in my fight to be 
a superhero against racism, I turned into a bigot. Now I turn the mirror and I'm showing it to people and say, you see what an asshole looks like? <laughs> where are you in this story? When you see these events happen, where are you? What do you think? How does it make you feel? How can you not, if you have any semblance of humanity, grok with this kid? So by the time you get to the end, and I've done my transformation as far as, you know, okay, yeah, I'm a bigot, but I can do something about that. You know, maybe just talking to people, you know, and hit them with what I think is a way that we can consciously, mechanically, you know, mathematically get out of this crap, you know, as antibodies fighting this cancer of racism in the body of our society. There are so many questions. I've hit people on so many different levels. I've, I've, I've touched so many chords in them, if they're sitting there as human beings. And even the most disgruntled races gets turned around. So we have very stimulating conversation. And this is with kids whose parents are racist who come with their parents' point of view to the show, which I encountered when I was in the North Country. <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah, the show touches folk, you know, more so than I ever even really planned. I was stunned, man, the reaction that my show got when I first brought it out. I was stunned. And this was six years ago. So the paroxysms and the spasms that happened positively in reaction to the show six years ago, I can only anticipate that it, it might be even better now. So yeah, yeah, because of its, because of its intent. <sighs> Look, I'm trying to foster humanity politics, okay? I'll break it down just like that, humanity politics. It's the politics of humanity, because you talk, start thinking of human beings then, and see the humanity in yourself, you can't help but see other people as human beings. Short answer, yes. <laughs> This is a fascinating conversation about the role of theater, too, because uh, you may rem I'm certain you remember, Leland, but uh, actors playing jazz, we got to the talk back, and this woman in the audience, and I'm not calling her out, said, you guys could be actors. You're good as any actors I ever saw anywhere. And, and I remember you saying, well, we are actors. And she said, well, but you could do it professionally. And we could do this professionally. You know, like, and so there is that ability of the good actor with the good story to transport people, right? So I think the biographical piece of your piece is obviously important, but uh, you know, with actors playing jazz, you guys were able to do that well enough that she was there with you, right? She believed you were, you just got out of prison and you guys put on a show and, and uh, while it was a, it was a, it didn't shine really well on her. It shone, it shone really well on you guys and your ability to do that piece. Yeah, that was, that was, that was kind of funny. That was funny. And it is, it is the power that you have as a, as a performer, you know, as an artist, to, you know, get inside of people's viscera and it really, you know, affect them. Uh, and that's, that's the point, man. And you got to do it with knowledge and intent. You know, no, and it's, it's a responsibility, man. It, it's, 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 a, it's a huge responsibility. But come on, theater has been didactic since day one. It was meant to teach. It was meant to reveal. It's just what it's about, you know? So, you know, yeah, yeah. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten about that. That was funny. I hope we have an opportunity to do that piece again. Yes. Uh, Reentry is is really germane to these times as well because it, it speaks to our perception of the people that we in our society have justly or unjustly incarcerated and what their journey is to find their own humanity and to be human beings once again in the eyes of society. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a germane piece right now, too. Yeah. Helen, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Helen. Hey, Helen, how you doing? Uh, 
I'm well. Uh, thank you for, you know, doing this. Um, I, we've been speaking a lot about sort of systematic, institutionalized racism um, that, you know, that we're all experiencing and, and all trying to dismantle. I have a more personal question for you. So I'm an actor, um, and a year ago, I was in a, a graduate program for, to get my master's in acting. And I had the luxury of uh, like over, was it like five weeks, six weeks, whatever, like a chunk of time where I was allowed to do sort of a developmental workshop to create my own show about my own experience. Um, I'm half Chinese. Uh, I'm often white passing, um, but I'm, I'm half Chinese. And I, the show um, was slash is about sort of the, the clash that can kind of happen between the way others believe my life, how I experience myself essentially versus how I actually experience myself. Um, and in this workshop, I sort of kept on coming up with this barrier of, um, I, I am creating this show to inform, to express myself, to just widen what's available out there. Um, but I will likely be doing this to a white audience, entirely white audience. Um, and that is going to inherently shift how the show is, is how I have to kind of nitpick at the show so that it does reach the people who need to hear it. Um, and I would come up against, I had a, I had a wonderful instructor who was, uh, who's sort of one of those woke people but who had a completely blank face when I was like, so I feel really uncomfortable putting chopsticks in my hair, but I hear your point about showing rather than telling. <laughs> um, like completely just like to the point where I ultimately burst into tears um, because they, I, they weren't reading it or I just, it was a complete, and, and it was so useful to have that experience in that I'm like, oh, so this is where we are at. Like there are going to be people who, with your knowledge, with your empathy, who are just, just don't, and it's not from some, some uh, horrible place, but I was in Scotland and they have, <laughs> they have very few minorities there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, uh, you, you sort of touched on it in like, basically turning and at least in your show so our shows sort of have a different sort of they're like the same and completely different at the same time oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah and uh you you'd mentioned that you sort of or i guess a mechanism that you used was turning the interrogation on yourself so that people would empathize with you before kind of shifting it out so that others would see themselves in what you just did. And I guess beyond that, like how did you navigate that creative space where did, did you, did you, um, did you just show people and just get their response and start nitpicking it? Did you, did you like, like, how did you navigate that creative process of trying to create something that is authentic to you, but that would be understood by the people who would be watching? I didn't care. Hmm. It's not my job to shepherd you through your experience. It's my job to give you unapologetically oh, you froze you i froze i oh, know <laughs> i'm still here can you hear me what happened no my internet connection was unstable so i didn't everybody froze um okay. <laughs> this is what i'll get this, this okay uh if i understand you correctly i'm gonna come at it like this um <laughs> when i finished writing my show or when i thought i had finished writing my show Showed it to my wife. She's a writer for documentary films. You know, she helps me with my stuff. 
in my, my first best critic, right? She said, there's something missing. You're not telling the truth about something. Oh, really? Uh-huh. So I went back and I, <laughs> you know, went back in, <laughs> went back inside and I realized, oh, oh, here's the truth. This is the ugly truth that I've been avoiding all of this time. This is the thing that's been in my face all of this time that I did not want to share with anybody. <laughs> this is that thing that I am not telling. And until I tell this truth, my thing will not be done. I told the truth, put it in my play. When I wrote the last words of my play, talk amongst yourselves, I broke down into tears. Why? Because I knew I had told my truth. And that shit wasn't as scary as it was until after I had done it and got the response to my truth. It is not my job to shepherd you through your experience of my truth. It is my job to present you with my truth. And when you do that, it's the scariest fucking thing on the planet because you're doing this. Come on in with your dirty boots and golf spikes and nasty hands and filthy ideas here. That's power. That's what gets people to listen to you. When you're authentically, honestly revealing your truth, that bell of truth inside of people I was talking about the other day, clang, clang, clang. That's been my experience. And that's the advice I give to everybody who ever asked me about what I should do in writing my piece, what I should do in exploring my piece. Tell the truth. It's not your responsibility. You don't have to make it soft for them. Make it truthful. The people that can eat it will eat it. The people who can't won't, at least not then, but that Bella has been wrong and they might find themselves nibbling on it down the line. You understand? Mm. Tell you the truth. Uh, excuse me, folks, and fuck them. Because on one hand, it's yeah, it's for public consumption and it is for the public. But the only way you're going to get it out there in the way you want it out there, in the authentic way, is to do it without regard for them. This is it. This is an apple. Boom. If you see a banana, that's your problem. But this is an apple. I hope I answered your question. It was helpful. <laughs> um, I think, I, uh, I think, I'm sort of at the stage where I've I've, I've gone through like two rough drafts essentially at, at, at this point, um, and I would get feedback sessions afterwards um, about sort of people not understanding something or. Or, or what people wanted to see versus what I did, it, particularly in the show versus hell, but after the, the, the first iteration. Um, and I think, I think what, you're, what you're tapping into for me is there are things that I feel very vulnerable about that I will tear up thinking about without speaking about here. And, you know, sort of struggles that my parents went through, my, my mom in particular, and sort of removing herself so that I would have a better life from my life in certain circumstances. And I guess, I guess in the end, it's sort of like going and, and combating and just sort of confronting my own fears of sharing that. Because I, I'm, I'm less protective of myself than I am protective of my family. And it's the kind of thing where like, maybe that's what you're saying is still true. Um, but it's like, if I present this and this is my mom and people just, don't get it. Don't just like, that hurts me much more. And I think I'm afraid of that. 
you know, uh, you, I, I'm searching for an analogy here mm. that will, 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 um, that, that's, that's, <laughs> there's a couple words that, that's where you need to go, darling. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that. I could feel that. Those are, those are the <laughs> yeah. things that you need to tell. You, yeah. know, you honor your ancestors. You know, mm -hmm. you don't disparage them. You know, yeah. you are honoring them by making them, by telling the world their effect on you, the, the, the life that they had. You're, 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 you're reinvigorating their energy in the world by talking about them. That's how I feel about my mom. When I talk about my mom and my show, you know, it's part of your truth. And that vulnerability you know, I mean, we're all vampires, man. We're all emotional vampires. That's what we want. Give it to me. Give it to me. I want to see your pain. I want to see your pain. That's why TV shows are hits. That's why people go to the movies. They want to see somebody else's pain. So, you know, it's terrible to say that, but you're not going to have a hard time by being vulnerable. You're going to be more valuable by being vulnerable. People want to see behind the scenes. That's why we have all these Hollywood reporter shows. They want to see celebrities, you know, in pain. You know what I mean? This, it's... The vulnerability you're talking about is the gold that you're holding on to, that you need to disseminate to the universe. It's, you're going to choke on it. You're going to not find authenticity until you let it go. That baby is going to be stillborn unless you can bring it out into the world with full fanfare. Don't hold on to your truth. Inject it into your peace. That's what's going to make all the difference in the world. And it's scary. It's scary. When I realized the fact that I had been running from being a black man my entire life, my entire life, I had hated myself for being a black man. That's why all the self-destructive comes in. You know, I hate myself, so I am. I find no value in myself. How can I have anybody else find value in me if I can't find it in myself? That truth was what I had to go back and write before I can get to the point where I can say, oh, I'm okay now. Because until I found that, I could not embrace my fear. I could not embrace that darkness, which then buoyed me along my journey because it's all part of me, man. It's all part of you. And if you want to tell a truthful story about a truthful thing that is your life truly, you can't leave out the good parts. You just can't. Not to be honest to yourself and to your story. You know, there's a, 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 a black British actress of Nigerian descent. We've had the same conversation. She did not want to reveal herself to what she knew was going to be a predominantly white audience and then feel judged. Your most destructive and most nutritional judge is yourself. Don't judge yourself. Let somebody else do it. Build your own esteem and don't put the weight on somebody else to give it to you. Do your thing, girl. <laughs> do your thing. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Stroll yeah. on, soldier. It's going to be okay. You're going to get that, that, you That's the it. thesis statement of everything. It's going to be okay. Tell your truth. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I yeah. think so. So we have another, you know, solo artist here. Leslie, you had a question. Actually, I just want to, um, I want to honor what Helen and Leland were just talking about by saying, Helen, um, I, among other things, I have a solo show that's uh, fictionalized, but it, it draws from the headlines. Uh, it harrowed my mom to watch it more than twice, but she was glad to be there. Um, but I just wanted to say that, the emotion you're bringing to this lets you know, as Leland said, that that's gold. Mm -hmm. And part of what makes me, I hate rehearsing my solo show. I always feel like I want to barf and die. <laughs> but that's because I'm not in communion with the audience when I'm rehearsing. I say to my husband before I do it, remind me why I always do this. And he says, you'll know the minute you walk on the stage. And indeed, after I had done it a few times, when I walk into my space, into my light, and I begin to speak, 
I recognize that whatever I get back from those people, or if there are a couple people that is too intense and they get up and leave, or if Gertrude, Gertrude always turns to Martha and says, I can't hear her. What did she say? At one point, no matter what those responses are, you feel the energy of your power. And after you've done the show several times and it grows and you tweak it in response to how you, what you learn as Leland was saying is your deeper truth. And, and you begin to be truly an artist in relationship to it, not just emotionally, but you can choose the words you like and the movements you like. You're gonna be able to look back at 15, 20, 25 or more performances of this. And you're gonna own that power, that gold that Leland was talking about. And it will have been worth it. And as you perform it and you refine it, you will find the strength to endure those moments where someone gets up and walks out and you don't know if it's just because they needed to use the restroom or because they're judging you or the insensitive things that people say and talk back. You'll be able to depend on uh, the power that you felt in communion with them. It's very hard to understand how that will feel when you're rehearsing it in an empty room. But I know that you have it and that you will be there. Um, so having said that, I will just say briefly that what I wanted to, to just add to this conversation is I worked for many years in university. I like to say I'm a refugee from academia. Um, and But one thing that I miss from being in academia is that there was a built-in uh, comparative diversity. There was a lot more diversity among the student body at Northeastern and at Muhlenberg College than I have in the seacoast of New Hampshire in terms of audiences. And I largely work within, they wouldn't like me to say this, but the community theater situation right now where there was almost no money to produce and where actors work for free mm -hmm. and um, sometimes there's a little division of the gate and uh, of people get $16 after they've done all the three months of work or whatever but there is definitely a self-perpetuating cycle because a lot of the work that I direct um, or produce in those venues was written by uh, white retirees who are fairly well off. This is a discretionary activity at this time in their life. In fact, uh, Janae McCartan, who is our pretty much our one reviewer left in the seacoast of New Hampshire, she, when she reviews a play, she says, well worth your discretionary income, or, <laughs> or not. And I, oh, that phrase always reminds me, oh yes, this thing that I do, that I have had the privilege to do, that another colleague of mine calls it hashtag NH so white, this activity of community theater here. Um, it is, it requires discretionary income, time, et cetera, to do. And there's every year or so a show is written usually by a white playwright that calls for actors with color. And we, we sort of grip our, 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 the chairs of our arms for as if uh -oh. we starship yeah. enterprise under attack and we go okay now we have to import actors from outside of the new hampshire seacoast which brings in so many ethical quandaries because you know do you pick up the phone and call that one black actor that you remember who was so fantastic who will take your call do you prepare to have that fantastic talented woman in portland just frankly rip you a new asshole and say don't look to me to solve your problem i'm i run a theater of color it's on you to solve this problem and so what i will say is i just keep doing it i realize that there are periods of time where i sit back and relax and think okay i've got a lot of white actors who want to have a play i need to find a white play and then i'm hit between the eyes by someone who says I'm writing a play for the Dominican community of Lawrence, Massachusetts. And I go, oh, I want to barf. And then I say, yes, yes, yes. Outreach is going to be hard. It's going to be really, really hard. And I may fail, but I just got to do it. And this is the loop that I've been in for the past 10 years or so. And sometimes things work and sometimes things don't. Sometimes at the last minute, oh my gosh, you have to put an Italian girl in a Native American role. And then you try and put out a press release and have a talk back about why you got stuck doing that. Um, and just fighting the fight. I also have to say in response to um, Leland, you said something earlier about a biracial woman, young woman, a teacher who doesn't, who reads as black to the world, but white uh, 
to herself or she or she doesn't realize yeah, it, was, it was a student not a teacher it was a student a, a, a student yeah, yeah i have a uh, i'm i'm helping to raise my half uh, african nephew who is a six foot five 22 year old black man living in new hampshire who is on the spectrum and doesn't know that he's black and doesn't think that racism is a problem here and delivers pizza for a living so he's in his car delivering pizzas to the doors of white people all the time. And I generally don't tell this story because I do not want to be congratulated. I don't go on social media and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm so woke. But I feel that in um, every, a part of my day imaginatively is walking in his shoes. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to have that imaginary you know, that opportunity to step into that. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to just be a practical material and emotional support to him. And I know it is to the teeny, teeniest morsel of the fear and pain uh, that families in the United States and all around the world are experiencing. So thank you so much again for this conversation today. And those are the thoughts I have to share about being a solo artist trying to create a diverse theater in New Hampshire and working through feeling like you got a barf. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I want to speak to the, the last thing that you talked about, um, uh, how to approach this. Uh, in my family, you know, my mom, there's, there's four kids and there's three fathers, right? <laughs> so my mom was prolific in a way as well. You know, uh, my brother, and my younger sister, my younger brother and younger sister, from, you know, they're of a family, you know, they have the same father. My younger brother married a white woman, had children. Uh, two sons, specifically, uh, Sean and Bradley. Uh, that's as far as I'll go there, except for Bradley, they live in Ohio, right? Now, Bradley and Sean, Bradley looks a lot like you, though. <laughs> You know, so he's living in the, uh, the wilderness of Ohio. And he and uh, my brother's oldest daughter come to my house uh, for dinner, you know, in Park Slope. And Brad tells me that uh, he hasn't experienced anything about being a black man where he lives. I mean, he, he's often, if people don't, if he doesn't tell them, nobody knows that he's black. I said, uh, huh, you live out there, huh? So you, you, you're feeling some white privilege up there as a black man, ain't you? He said, well, I guess so, you know. I gave him Tani, my only copy, Tanahisi Coates, Between the World and Me. I gave it to him. Next time I saw him, he had gone to Dayton to go to college. Yeah, Leland, Uncle Lee, I know what you're talking about now. Because it's not about so much, and this was a theme of the slave play. I don't know if you saw that. I was, I was lucky enough to see the slave play. Uh, one of the characters in the slave play was this fair-skinned black man who went through his entire life not realizing that the world saw him as black. There ain't no racial problem here. He didn't see himself as black, so he didn't see it. When he got, <laughs> when the realization that he is, the realization of the perspective that he had been missing landed on him, the guy in the play, as well as my nephew. It was kind of a, it was a profound thing. It was, I almost hated to see it. But by the same token, I was, I was, I was happy because at least now he knows where he's at, which is important. As far as what you're doing in your theater, yeah, keep soldiering on, darling. Because, <laughs> you know, there was a woman in Baltimore who took over Baltimore Center Stage and the subscription base was completely white. By the time she left, she had a multicultural subscription base. This is in Baltimore, okay, granted. It's a little bit more of a chocolate city, you know. But I mean, it's worthy of the fight, man. Um, again, it speaks to, you're in your lane, doing what it is you can do. And as, as heinous as it is, like my wife says, you're gonna get on this bandwagon and do something. What, what, you got skin in the game or what? You know, you got to bring skin in the game. You do that, apparently, and I congratulate you for that. Okay, and the stuff you said about the, the, the solo performing and, you know, all the gold waiting for girlfriend when she gets there is absolutely true. Because the more you, you do your show, the more you own it, the more it becomes you and your effect on your show then translates into effect on the audience. And it's like, 
it becomes something that you never really <laughs> expected when you started. It just gets bigger and bigger. So yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that. Appreciate you. Any other thoughts or questions out there? Oh yeah, go ahead, Peter. Um, just very briefly again, I'm so grateful for this conversation. It, um, and this can be very, very quick. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s, I had the sense that we had a national story and that we were all, we all knew what the story was. And, and of course, we realize now that that story was wildly incomplete and inaccurate. But over the last, at least the last decade, what has occurred to me, and this goes back to something that Matt and Leland were talking about earlier, what has occurred to me is that we don't have that national story anymore. Mm. Um, and that part of what our communities need right now is co-authors who can tell the story. That's all, a shared story that is genuinely co-authored which I think is actually what the three who have talked about their solo projects are talking about. Mm -hmm. Helen is co-authoring a story with her parents. Mm -hmm. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the things, see, my wife loves Chris Cuomo, Cuomo, cause you know, he's fair and balanced, right? He does present both sides of the situation. He really is one of the few you know, of course, uh, radio, per uh, television personalities that, that do that. And I think what is important is, and what has been missing in the history of American, um, in American history is that um, it's only been told from a certain perspective. It hasn't been told from a broader perspective. I mean, uh, uh, for example, my wife is a documentary filmmaker. She just finished work on a piece called The Vote, which uh, delineates the last 10 years of the women's suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that uh, this guy, one of the things that she wanted to tackle was to integrate the story of black people, black women specifically, into a story that has eliminated them or marginalized them, not said anything about any contribution they may have had or not. You know, so this is an incomplete history that is being pervaded in our country, right? So you don't get the, 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 the nuances of other things that may have been happening and the influences on, you know, the Southern white states on the lack of suffrage ratification, <laughs> all of this, simply because we had a different perspective injected into the story, which makes it a fuller and more truthful representation of, of our history. So yeah, to have people tell this story from discrete perspectives, absolutely. That's interesting. Now that comes up, boom, bubble in my head. The, the, you folks that have theaters and, and the students, you know, make a show, improv your perspective on this, write it down, present a show to your to to to, to the students and your to the faculty to whatever, but create this just like that peter from perspective your perspective of this moment take six or seven kids and have them improv something and write it down you build a show and it's like <clears throat> we've done something that's incredible that's that's boom okay yeah right <laughs> before you know we we closed school march 13th and i've been saying to my students ever since then, one of the most important things you can do right now is write, is write stuff down because your legacy uh, very well could be that 150 years from now, people are saying to themselves, how did they get through the pandemic? And there's a journal that exists that some 15 year old wrote, here's what I did and here's, here's the thoughts that were going through my head in that moment in time. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I I, I push them all the time, like, just write, just write, 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 write a journal entry, write something down, um, because we need it, and you need it, you know, so. That yeah, foster some Anne Franks, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Other thoughts, questions? Hi, Mr. Cahoon. Yes, go ahead. Um, no, I, I, th I think that's definitely an interesting point about um, certainly documenting things and uh, because I think when we're all conscious of that, it allows for more perspective to come in because not everybody's story is certainly the same. Not everybody's feeling what they're going through. So, you know, if someone were to want to write something about this in the future, you know, the more people that we have um, talking or giving their own perspective, that it allows for more a collective um, feel and idea of the situation because, you know, perspe different perspectives helps, helps us perform. Uh, make our own idea on it. So I think, especially in this time, certainly what's going on, that's why I think I'm, along with other people, are trying to um, get an understanding of those different perspectives that we might not have not have really thought about before, or like given full attention to, you know, listening to these other voices and, you know, trying to get a sense of um, that experience and, um, understand so I thought I think that's very interesting cool yeah yeah man um, I think it was uh, uh, was it Peter that was talking about uh, and I think this goes to perspective no it wasn't Peter it was uh, I'm sorry it, it was the guy hmm I kept I, I, I forgot your name man I'm sorry but you did say something about how quickly the gay movement caught on and that it was probably a result of people looking in their families and seeing gay people in their families. And it's hard to hate a genre of people that you have in your own backyard, you know. You're looking at that. That's the same thing with people of color. My wife says her friends, uh, the only black person they know is me. So when they look at the news and what's happening in New York, they're concerned more so than they would be if they didn't know me. So it's the, the people that are having those kinds of perspectives because they have something a little bit closer to home that have something to add to this, you know? Perspectives are very important to understand someone else's, of course, but again, <laughs> you know, yeah, I keep coming back to it. The most, perspective to, the, the most important perspective to understand is your own. So that's what has to be ferreted out at all costs. That's where everything starts because if your perspective is clear, when you go to talk to somebody else with their perspective, now we get inherent drama, especially if their perspective is different from yours, right? right. Now you write that down, you got a scene, right? <laughs> you got a scene, mm -hmm. you keep going on, you got to play, you know what I'm saying? So uh, a point of view, an authentic perspective, we've come to, through a synthesis of your life experience at that moment, translate it to something on a page that can then be put on a stage, <laughs> Priceless, right? <laughs> that's, that's yeah. Great, yeah. Uh, Justin, you had your hand up there. Go ahead. I'm still learning how to unmute. I apologize. Justin, yeah, um, that's the guy. Yeah, hey, Justin. <laughs> I forgot your name. Howdy. Um, um, you said something that uh, a little bit earlier that resonated with me about, um, you know, somebody may not be, uh, be a convert after seeing a certain show where they take a little piece away with them, right? And over time, it makes them question something in time, right? So mm. maybe some folks' perspectives shift more slowly and you have to leave room for that, right? And um, I, I think one experience maybe you've had that, that is really unique is, is in, in touring your pieces and in participating in audience talkbacks. Um, um, having a conversation with a, in a in a room full of people where there's not a um where everyone has not achieved the same levels of sort of performative wokeness right so maybe people want to ask a question but they're afraid they'll say something dumb or they do ask a question that is maybe awkwardly phrased and then maybe they feel like they got laughed at or something and i think you know what's going to be an interesting aspect of trying to be more cognizant of programming in a place like New Hampshire is how to foster spaces that audiences aren't afraid to come to because they don't feel like they have the language or the knowledge. Does that make any sense? Yeah, um, yeah. 
the first thing that comes to mind, Justin, is the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing water and I'm looking for horses to come. You know, if you come, you know, I may be preaching to the choir. If you don't come, then I can't touch you. You know, you have to decide in your mind whether or not you want to be hydrated. So, you know, once you come to the space, I do whatever I can out of the box. When the show is done, the first thing I say to kids and adults alike, the only question that's stupid is the one you don't ask. This is a completely free space. And if somebody tries to take advantage of that or usurp that, I'm the moderator. I can kick it in the ass. Get out of here. This is not what we're doing. Leave your ego and bullshit at the door. We're trying to have a conversation here. So as a moderator, I make everybody know that nothing they say, regardless of what the crowd might do, okay, look, you got to give space. If you want respect, you're going to have to give respect. If you want space, you're going to have to give space. So as the moderator in that space, that's the only thing I can control. You know, I can't control whether they're there or not. I'm hoping that the people who booked me to come have more control over people coming to the space, you know what I mean? But once we are in that space, it is as safe a space as I can make it. So, you know, um, I mean, and still in all, okay, still in all, as safe as I've made spaces, I've had somebody, there was a kid once who uh, reached me on Messenger on Facebook to, to, uh, talking about, you know, things that he did not want to bring up in that safe space. But we were then subsequently able to deal with on a one-on-one -on -one basis, right? But he felt safe enough in that space to contact me later to broach the subject matter, right? So yeah, it's important to maintain a semblance of respect and humanity in that space. You know, how can I do anything else when I just did that show? You know, now, again, and I guess this is all the bottom line, because I've done so many small audience shows, you know, how to get people to the venue to come drink this water. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, we're trying to figure out a way to do that. Because water fresh, water clean, <laughs> water good. <laughs> come have some water. <laughs> I need to come up with a compelling commercial, you know what I mean? But so you're, you're really speaking to, and Justin too, speaking to the role of theater and that it's a, the challenge can start with, uh, sep I don't mean the word separating, but distinguishing those audience members who want to come to the theater to be challenged, to think, to go through a process mm -hmm. for themselves versus those who want to unplug for two hours and watch people um, tap dance on stage, right? Um, and that, and then you you parse that down even further into people who want to come to the theater and really have to address questions of themselves. Um, you are getting to a pretty woke slice of the audience, right? Where uh, really quickly, and I, you know, I I I thought to myself earlier, Leland, just call it Rhapsody in Blue. Get all the old people to come, and then do your show and you'll get the right audience there, right? But um, yeah, I, mean, I think as producers, that's always a challenge is, is like, I, I want to sell you medicine in a way, which is really hard, you know? I'm not selling you uh, showgirls and, and, you know, fans. I'm selling you conversation mm -hmm. and thought provoca you know, provocation. And that's, that's a harder sale sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Come on in, let me slap your wrist. <laughs> <laughs> come on in let me hit you in the forehead with something. come on in <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean yeah hmm. but this is uh this is the challenge you know which is why maybe the times we're in presently might help you know lubricate that journey but lubricate you know that 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 process of getting people uh, interested enough to come in and talk about some stuff. Yeah. Karen, did you have a question? I mean, I, I'm just listening to this and I think that it's really challenging to get um, that captive audience. Mm -hmm. And theater is a really important and effective mechanism to engage folks. It seems like if you're looking at who may need to hear some of this, you know, reaching school children and, universities, um, 
you know, that those are places where you can get a captive audience and perhaps by advocating for policy and curriculum changes to um, address institutional racism and discrimination in our society would be a way to go because if we could embed that kind of requirement um, in our um, curriculum, then this would be one really effective way for schools and universities to meet that requirement. And then you have that captive audience and you can get those conversations going and maybe have people included who wouldn't take the time to you know, spend the $20 to go at seven o'clock to Pinkerton to hear it and, and see it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is exactly what's happening. When I was talking about doing a workshop for, for teachers in the Wapping Ridge Falls uh, School District, I, it's, a, it's a perennial for me, or I hope it's perennial. It has been annual, right? And so I go up there every year and I do a show. And um, it, it's, they won the workshop because they intended to uh, uh, create curriculum right, around, right along these lines in order to further this, this whole process. Uh, much of the work that I've done with this show has been in educational situations where I'm doing shows for you know high school kids, uh, with college kids, and those are the captive audiences. Those are where I have the full houses. You know, uh, the evening shows with adults not so much. Okay, but one of the phenomenon that happened was when I have a show like in um, uh, what's Schenectady, or, yeah, uh, we'd had an afternoon show and kids came and says okay. If you like the show, bring your parents to the next show. And, you know, kids bring their parents and the parents come, you know. So it, it's, it is a process and it, it, it's like trying to burn a, a blade of grass at a time, trying to get a grass move, movement, you know. <laughs> but, you, you know, uh, like Helen, you know, you got to keep, uh, you know, keep it on, even if it's just one strand at a time. And you, I'd also really like to see police departments having to, endure uh, this kind of performance and actually explore the institutional racism in our criminal justice system and their role in it. And um, I think that, you know, having, you know, maybe that's just another place to push our leadership in government to, they themselves, start exploring these issues in this kind of way and also to um, really consider policing in our country and really have them dig deep to look at how institutional racism furthers, you know, racism and violence against black people and other people of color in this country. Yeah, I had a friend, well, the guy who's my company manager and stage manager said to me the other day, sent me a test. He says, uh, everybody in the police academy should be, you know, this should be uh, required viewing for everybody in the police academy. So did you come out, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. There are efforts, there are efforts <laughs> along those lines. I mean, uh, I think there's some kind of, uh, it's not Police Academy, but it is West Point. There's somebody up at West Point interested in bringing the show there, which is helpful, I guess, in, in that avenue. Uh, yeah. yeah. It immediately makes me think, um, Carrie, it immediately makes yeah. me think of um, Theater of War and what they're doing um, and how they're, what launched that pro project was a, multi-million dollar grant from the Department of Defense. Ah. And yes, they're talking about essentially care for soldiers and dealing with that. But so that's going to the, there are many sources of that problem, but that is going to a chief source of that problem to, to talk about it, to invite conversation again. Right. And so I think, I think you're onto something, Karen. Let's do it. <laughs> something, something that I was going to say, um, piggybacking on Karen's suggestion, is that um, I've been part of UNH's Power Play Interactive Development, which is an applied theater troupe uh, for profit branch, not profit. In, COVID may kill it, but um, they are a, a business that the theater department started to go in and do training in university departments, but also in corporate situations because of the need to talk about harassment and bias. And so, and why did that happen? Because the Me Too movement, it was starting before that, but it really picked up with the Me Too movement because suddenly there are companies who want to be able to tick a box and say that they've had training. So I think that coming out of this, there's going to be an opportunity where um, whether they are 
earnestly wanting to be woken or not, there are going to be organizations in government and in the corporate world that need to check a box and to convince these folks that instead of just going in and doing, you know, power play, just really marvelous, detailed work. But there are some folks who just get, you know, someone who goes in and does a, uh, who looks exactly like the people in the company and does a um, motivational speaking thing and they call it ticking the box turning them to focus on something like Leland show is going to be great. But the other piece of it that I wanted to mention, because, you know, at one time in my life, I was really just trying to put my solo show out there, which also among other things talks about uh, the effect of a Vietnam veterans experience on, on his family. It, as we all know, it's so terribly difficult to be the artist and the CEO of your business and the activist advocate. And so really what, what was frustrating to me with my work with veterans and theater and all of this is so many people in the moment after the show would be so inspired. <laughs> I, we would all be exhausted from having done something for the community and they would come up and say, this is great. Every member of Congress should see this. And I'd go, great. Do you have $150,000 and, you know, seven staff members to help me do that? And they'd be like, no, but you should do it. And so again, that, that comes down to, Leland, you know what I'm talking about. So it comes yeah. down to, to partnership. And for everybody after this conversation, I think to remember a bunch of different things. And one of them is simply that Leland has a marvelous show. And, uh, you know, another is that there are several people who uh, have connections to New Hampshire state agencies and arts agencies. And, you know, what are the ways that we can make this lo logistically? Are there specific things we can walk away from? Yes, there are larger conceptual things and the knowledge that we have to uh, understand our own lane, expand our own power, and work within what we do. But also, hey, help an artist out, you know? Artists, by the time they're finished writing, rehearsing, etc., building their website, everything else they're doing, we need so many different partners at different areas in the community. Um, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody to make that connection happen. Yes, Theater of War is a fantastic example of something that took off, but it was a unicorn in the sense that the people creating the art also had the chutzpah and the contacts yeah. to make that happen at that moment. And so it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of those different people to make it happen. I hope it happens with Leland show. That would be great. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I think one thing um, I I, I kind of made fun of an audience member at Actors Playing Jazz, and now I'm going to give another one credit. I mean, one of the one of the themes of that piece, uh, Leland, is recidivism rates for people involved in these theater groups went way down. Right? There's there's data that shows that when these people are involved in um, creating art in this in this case creating theater they're less likely to reoffend. and one of the audience members said why don't we just teach second graders to be theater artists and eventually we won't have people breaking the law to begin with and so and so maybe the answer to this isn't necessarily sorry leland not to take work away from you not to get the high schoolers to see leland show but to get the elementary school kids to start to play with empathy and start to understand what it is to walk in somebody else's shoes. And that's what we can do with theater. So, um, you know, I think the further and further and further back we go, the closer to birth we can get. <laughs> Try to get in there and start to influence, the better off we'll be. Yeah, I mean, I've done my show for like sixth and seventh graders and it's just too young. Yeah. I mean, they get something, but um it's just too too it's too heady and and it's, look dropping the bucket still fills the bucket you know eventually but still it, it's like programming for kids along this, there is no dearth of programming for kids okay my first agent was a child's program it's unbelievable mm -hmm. the content that's being you know shoved around the country for kids but it's all you know music and fun and magic and bubbles and balloons and like what's real <laughs> you know so something that can get to these kids that is a little bit more substantive that they can ingest is is always to be desired because if you get them before they're poisoned we have a much better chance <laughs> you know much better chance um 
Hi, I'm Emma. I joined late because I was working, but um, this I actually wanted to ask a question about this, um, so I'm glad we kind of circled back to education. Um, I saw Rhapsody in Black when I was probably 11, like 11 or 12 or something, um, because it, it came to the Stockbridge, um, and mm. uh, it, I agree, was intense. Um, it was moving, but intense for you know, an 11 year old white girl in New Hampshire. Um, but that was a question I had about if there's any watering down or censorship that you do when you bring your piece into a school and what, um, you know, your educational materials look like when you do that. Um, because I am graduating, so is Michael, who's in the call uh, in a week. And so I think we've been reflecting a lot about what we were taught, especially in the way that, uh, we are leaving high school um mm -hmm. and so i you know there are many methods i think to um this kind of education i've throughout my experience i've seen you know people trying to scare us into believing things people trying to you know uh bring it out of bring it bring it out of us ourselves um and so i was just wondering if there's any kind of censorship or watering down or what your educational materials with the piece look like when you bring it into yeah uh the, the thing that you saw was already an iteration of a watered down <laughs> play because it did not have any of the sex drugs and rock and roll <laughs> that were inherent in my life okay uh i was uh prohibited from bringing those things because it was uh, said to have been more intense for young people, too intense for young people to ingest. <clears throat> Wanting that, what you saw is got to be what you saw with no further reduction. Because again, I get back, well, you, you're just joining us. We were talking about truth and the telling of that truth and the importance of purveying that truth because that truth will then be resonating in the truth of other people receiving this information. Uh, yeah. Um, and it, it's intense and uh, reality is intense. Watching someone go through intense things is an intense experience for the viewer. And it does have an intense, it does elicit an intense response. And without all that intensity, what kind of effect is it really gonna have on you? Right. You eat ice cream cone and yesterday, all you remember is you had an ice cream cone. What did it do for you? Nothing. It was fluff, it was candy, it was not, had no impact on it. So the intensity of a didactic experience through theater is meant to have an effect on you long lasting, the longer the better. So no, there is no further watering down of the show that is gonna be possible. Yeah. Uh, and I'm getting back to my other solo artists. Uh, and I had been advised all along the way because somebody told me, Woody King told me, you shouldn't be Rhapsody in Black, it should be Rap in Black. Because he asked me, do you want to make art or do you want to make money? I said, I want to make rap. I want to make money. Uh, I want to make art. So, you know, <laughs> like sponsor, you know. But like, tell your truth. And, you know, Spike Lee says, you know, listen to notes and whatnot. But after you've done all the research and know what it is you're going to write, I mean, there's got to be something there. <laughs> you know? So don't just change everything for every wind that blows you, you know. So, again, gets back to the purveyance of your truth. Now, I appreciate your experience. And I'm relaying an experience to you that I had while doing this show in the, the North Country. Uh, there was a young white student who, I had two shows that day, came to the show or was at the show in the morning and uh, had something to say to me in the talk back that she saw the show after the second show. So she had come back to the show to tell me that she loved the first show upset because I made her feel guilty for being white. But she came back to the show, sat through the show again in order to tell me that, huh. right? So I'm happy that she came back to the show, <laughs> but, you know, because it had an effect on her. She's trying to tell me it was a negative effect, but I know I rang her bell, okay? <laughs> the show rang her bell. And I told her in my responses, I didn't make you feel anything. I gave you an experience and what you felt about that experience is the work that you need to do. So I do have educational materials that I can disseminate to whomever, you know, there's a teacher's guide and whatever that gives you background, you know, uh, 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 collateral information and whatnot. Um, I can give you reading materials. 
to, 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 and I'll start you with, you know, the, uh, what is it, the Something Life of uh, Jim Crow. Uh, the Strange Career of Jim Crow, which chronicles the, you know, the, the life of racism, the genesis to where we are in this country, which is, it, it's, it's a deep read. It's very kind of heady, but it tells you why we are where we are in a mathematical fashion. And that's kind of intense too. You know, um, it's intentionally intensive. And I'm glad it hit you between the forehead, high from your forehead, and I'm glad, you know, I'm glad. And if it makes, if it fosters a little bit more curiosity in this time in your life about to enter this crazy world that you see exploding all around you, you know, um, it's gonna be helpful. Intensity ain't bad. I hope no one minds if I make a comment unless someone has a question. Um, but yeah, Emma was talking about that. I, I'm graduating as well too. And I actually had an experience uh, in my middle school where um, someone doing a presentation came to do an assembly and it was on like bullying. And the, he didn't really announce like how intense it would be to the, pe the school. The, and um, so upon watching it, it was, it definitely dealt with the heavier side of things and where it can lead, you know, to people committing suicide and how really dark things can get. And as a seventh or eighth grader, like, you know, they actually had a, the teachers had a talk back with us after because, you know, they send out an email, they didn't like to the school, whatever. And I personally found it to be uh, very profound and made me think about things more. But for other people, it's certainly not the same experience. And, you know, we had a discussion about how, like, well, where does it draw the line? And so that is a, a tough thing, but I, I, I agree with you. I think intensity is, is a good thing, or at least um, being very forward because how are, when you dull things out too much, how are we supposed to learn and get that idea and understanding? Um, like, I don't know if you saw this, but it, this is somewhat different, but like Sesame Street's doing that thing where like they're gonna talk about racism. Um, I haven't watched Sesame Street in a long time, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, but the, no, but like there's a there's a recent thing, and they're going to talk about like racism. I don't know if they're doing it like a news station or whatever, but I think I'm curious as to how they're going to tackle that and how forward it, it's going to be, but also is so it's digestible for that younger audience, mm -hmm. like you were talking about, you know. Um, and even then, say if it's they don't fully whatever they take in from that, if they don't fully understand it. How, how are the people surrounding them going to help them di digest it further? Because I feel like it's probably a lot more for younger kids to take that all in, but maybe that's on the people who are around them to support them to help the digestion a little bit. You know? oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that's, what's, that's what's been important. Uh, that's what the Walking with Schools, uh, Fall School System has, has, has determined, that uh, the more savvy the teachers can be, Right. Uh, to what the, the experience of the play is, uh, what the subject matter of the play is, what the play is trying to talk about, the thematic structure, blah, 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 blah. The more conversant they are with the material, the better they can help the kids digest and debrief after the experience. The intensity of the experience is going to, you know, go a long way toward, you know, how much can be done afterwards. Mm. You know, how much the needle can be moved. You know, if uh, the response is kind of nonchalant, you're not going to have as much effect as if somebody is completely off their pins. And then to be able to shepherd them through that situation, now they are vulnerable, but receptive. You know, mm -hmm. because uh, when you toss another ingredient into the salad, you got to retoss the whole salad. You know what I'm saying? So that's, right. that's part of the thing. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Go ahead, Gina. Hi there. Um, hey. I just, I wanted to just quickly, um, I don't know if Karen's still on or not because she, um, her video is not on, but I, I just wanted to say that her thought around bringing education to law enforcement was um, theater, theater to, uh, was really kind of, um, an aha, interesting. Aha, interesting. <laughs> um, and I think, as, as much as I love that idea, I think what I, 
struggle with a little bit about that is um, when we think about bringing education to a demographic of, of people or, or even beyond that, if it were to go beyond law enforcement. Um, so let me go back. So I work in a, a Jewish day school where we do a lot of education around the Holocaust, obviously, mm -hmm. right? It's a big part of our programming and we focus on it a lot. And I think part of why it's successful and there's a lot of funding for it is because as a society, we have made agreements that one, it, it happened, and two, it can never happen again, right? And so there has to just be constant education around that. And I, I think what I'm struggling with right now is that we, there aren't agreements about what is happening. Um, you know, and I think this kind of speaks to your point, Matt, about someone saying the sky is blue and somebody else saying it's green. And I, I can't watch what happened to George Floyd and say, you no, know, what I didn't, what I just witnessed was a murder. Like I saw somebody get murdered and then have somebody else see that and think of it completely different. I mean, I think we have to make agreements on what is happening in the world right now. And until we do that, until we can feel comfortable saying that this is a problem, like let's just start there <laughs> and then think about, how to build some education around that. And it just makes me really angry that as a country, we can't even come to some like norm setting around what, what is okay and what isn't. So I just wanted to speak to that. It just makes me really angry. Can I jump in for a moment, Gina? First, I wanna thank you for fighting the fight. I'm also a secular Jew living in New Hampshire, which in itself is always, I love to signal to anybody who acknowledges Jewishness exists and thank you for your work. But again, as an advocate for artists, uh, what Leland does is create theater and it's marvelous if he can put it within a Q&A and provide educational materials so that it can be put in front of students. But I think part of where I experience difficulty coming in is that educators and administrators and government agencies want to, to use Emma's word, water down an artistic experience that tells stories about characters that are specific and valuable because they're specific and make them fit an educational rubric that's sort of generalized. What you were saying, Gina, about the Holocaust education, the reason why so many of those uh, exhibits and museums and educational programs work around the Holocaust is the specificity of the imagery. Mm -hmm. And it gets tricky when we start talking about going to educate um, a group of people using theater because what it becomes is theatrical techniques and can we, can the group that's being educated tell you what it is that we want to be done? No. If we, we need to somehow foster the understanding that theater, as it is theater, not deconstructed and put back together for an educational setting, but theater in itself is an educational experience. Come witness, participate the way audiences do at theater. And, and I think there's been a little too much going in the other direction. Theater of War, what's so fascinating about it again is they said, we're gonna use classical theater, we're gonna do it as readings, we're gonna have celebrities read. So they got very specific about how they would use and honor theater as the theatrical event before putting it into the educational structure. So yeah, talking about going to, to address a, a government agency or something like that, I, I think we need to make them come to us a little bit in terms of, making sure that the theater can stand for itself and not just end up putting up a dog and pony show where the actor says, gee, I really have something to educate you about and they water it down and down and down. I don't know if I was as articulate as I would like to be, but there we go. I'd like to sort of jump in there and sort of tie some things together um, from what Leslie and Gina were talking about. I've had the great privilege to participate um, in two uh, projects with the ART in Cambridge. One was Anna DeVere Smith's Doing Time in Education. I don't know if you're familiar with that work, but she portrays a variety of different characters in exploring the pipeline, the prison pipeline, um, and racism, systemic racism in this country. And as well, I also uh, attended as an audience member a play that they did called The White Card, in which um, 
And the reason I mentioned is we've talked a lot about education and how do we um, bring in an audience of more than 18 and, and Cambridge worked with Harvard together and the audiences were full. They, they pulled all of different community members into this experience. Um, most were, I would say, not, uh, you know, were already looking to, to engage around these issues. Um, but what was amazing is that they built facilitators and broke into small groups and there were safe spaces in which to explore, as Peter was saying earlier, our own in internal biases and to begin that process of excavation. Um, I think it was incredibly meaningful for everyone who participated. I certainly sat in groups and heard very vulnerable and, um, you know, reflective people taking time to explore their own uh, racism and how and and make commitments about how to make changes in those behaviors. Uh, I think now is so ripe for more of this and creating those kinds of and as Leslie said earlier, you know, it takes a village. We can't expect artists to be doing all of this. We need to connect with community members and universities. And it's not just education for younger kids. I mean, we as, a, as grown adults have lots to learn. And I, I think that we are, there are enough of us who want to learn and we need to create spaces that allow us to experience art, but also to do the work. Um, and I think both, well, so both of those plays as well as Leland's work are other um, opportunities to start dialogue if you have theater companies that are looking to begin to engage with community. I, I recommend both of those pieces. Um, so we're, we're, we're running short on time. Kate, I saw your hand, so I'm gonna let, I'm gonna come to you and then uh, we'll wrap up with some words here from Leland. Go ahead, Kate. Um, Sorry, I did not realize the time, so this might actually be a bigger thing than not. But um, uh, I've been going to protests um, all week. I'm in Los Angeles uh, currently. And um, one of the things that I, I've seen at most of these protests has been um, organizers carving out a space for people to speak. Um, and, and saying if anyone has any words that they, that, that they need to get off their chest and people will come up and start telling their lives stories. They will bring poems. They will bring, bring challenges to, to the people sitting and listening. And that has been very powerful like for, for me personally. And, and, you know, as much as, you know, I, I like to think that I'm, an educated person. I'm not like, you know, there's always more, the, the wokest audience will still have more to learn. And in those spaces as well, um, the police are right there. The police are right there in their, their riot gear. And whether they're hearing these people speak or not, that's, that's on them. But it, it creates a space and it creates an audience for these stories to be told. And I'm, I don't know how to bridge that gap between the the stories of protest and bringing that into a theatrical setting and and creating that space in a in a structured theater for those voices to be heard in the same way um, and I don't know if it if it would be beneficial to to talk to organizers to talk with protest organizers about that and say, how do you get these people together? How do you get these stories heard in this setting and bring it to another one? Bring it to, a, I guess, a more structured, um, like uh, artistic or theatrical setting. And that's just something I I don't have the, the ability to do, but I, it's something I've observed and that's something I'm very curious about is how to how to take the feelings and the stories from these movements and bring them to a, an audience. Well, there, there's, a, there's, there's a play called 12 Angry Men mm -hmm. that uh, it's just 12 black men talking about racial profiling. 
and they just, it's a, a structured piece whereby these guys come in in a theatrical fashion and stand and deliver their, their speech, their, their experience, you know, and it's, it was very powerful. It was extremely powerful. And uh, the thing that I saw in that space that day, aside from the fact that these stories can be put in a dramatic sequence in order to present theater, to get these things out disseminated to an audience. In the audience were a couple of correctional officers, you know, who heard these stories and yet could still not bring themselves to say that shit is wrong. See, um, it was a very daunting experience. Because, you know, I knew that those two correctional officers were moved. They could not have been, if they were robots, then no. But as they were human beings, they were moved. But they're caught in a dilemma, right? And I'm speaking to those cops that were just standing there, that are listening to these people stand and deliver, right? I mean, not all cops are Derek Chauvin, okay? Not all cops are those two rookies right but because they all wear the same uniform i'm never knowing who's who <laughs> and when, when, who's gonna show up when <laughs> you know but again as i said before the bell of truth exists within everybody and just hearing these stories those cops cannot help but be affected now whether they take it home beat up their girlfriend beat up their wife you know drink a pint of vodka whatever they do with that something will be done with that so they have heard it. They have been wet by, you know, the moisture of this, these people's passion. Okay, it splashes all over them. They can't get away from it. They try to wash it out of your clothes. You can't wash it out your skin. Can't wash it out your psyche. It's there. They're hit. So know that I'm a student of human behavior, and that's just a fact. Okay, as human beings, that's a fact. Right? So there's a way that it can be done, put in a way, in, in, in a situation where it can become theater. Write those stories, those people, you know, standing and delivering their truths, you know, write them down. Have them, you know, come together in, in some kind of fashion. It, it takes an engine to do any of this. I'm just saying that it's possible to be done. And yeah, those cops are not unscathed. They, 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 they're just not, not in skate. Um, you're out there marching, I give it to you. I, I can't do that. I'm in my lane, you know, uh, trying to affect as much change as I can from my lane. But I, you know, I got that much respect for you, you know, because you're out there and who knows um, who you're going to meet that day, you know, so. Keep strolling, soldier, but be careful, okay? I appreciate you. I think, um, I think keep strong and be careful is a good kind of wrap up to this, to this moment together, Leland. And um, on behalf of Theater Kapow and the New Hampshire theater community here, I really wanted to thank you for taking the, the two hours out of your time and your life today to come have this conversation with us. And uh, I really appreciate it. No, man, I want to thank you for having me because uh, it's important. And I love doing my show, but I live for the talk back, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. Thanks, man. Looking to get Rhapsody in Black back to uh, New Hampshire in some capacity kind of as soon as possible. And I will certainly let all of you on this call know when Leland is going to be back up in the area and performing. Um, and, um, and I'll say that next week we're going to be back here in open training. We have um, Dan Safer, the artistic director of Witness Relocation Program, is coming to lead, which is a, um, a member company at La Mama, is coming to lead training next week. So um, if you can take the two hours next weekend, Please come join us for that training. And um, we're really thrilled with the turnout today and, and the beautiful conversation that took place. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Leland. Thank and you're you, welcome. Leland. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing with me. I appreciate you. Yeah. Stay so safe, everybody. Yeah.
Peace.